Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. A couple days ago, I was preparing for a program that we have put together that caters to women who have intuitive thinking preferences. And I was expanding my network and looking for all sorts of really cool NT women. And I was introduced to an amazing INTP woman named Dr. Denise Cook. And I immediately said, we got to have her on the podcast. The work she's doing is fascinating. It's uh, it's so interesting, the angle that she's taking. So I just want to give a warm welcome to our guest today, Dr. Denise Cook. Welcome to Personality Hacker. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to be here. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, I could give you an introduction, but I think you're going to do a much better job of talking about who you are and uh, what you're working on right now as far as personality types. Uh, So I'm Dr. Denise Cook. I have a PhD in neuroscience, which I got in 2012. And uh, since I graduated, I've been fascinated by Jungian cognitive functions. Uh, I kind of uh, landed into that field uh, due to serendipity because uh, cognitive functions are, and, and the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs type indicator, are um, persona non grata in academia. Uh, you don't hear about them. You don't take the tests. You don't, you know, it's, it's not um, the, lang- the lingo of um, academia. You never hear about it. Um, so once I stumbled upon it, uh, it really got me excited because it helped put together so many different threads that I had um, kept inside my mind that were all not connected. Um, And so at the end of my graduate school, I was like, oh my goodness, like Jungian cognitive functions and personality type, um, they help form a framework for um, all the data that um, neuroscientists are collecting. At least that's what I think. And so from there, I I decided to look more into it uh, to do some more research. Uh, and I hit a wall at some point because I was like, oh, well, how can I introduce Jungian cognitive functions to academia without having any concrete scientific data? And so it was at that point that I decided to launch a study trying to link and correlate DNA with the cognitive functions. So you're a bit of a renegade right now then <laughs> in academia, being actually interested in Carl Jung's work and specifically what you're talking about with with cognitive functions as it relates to neuroscience. So, I mean, obviously we're interested, you know, we're into it, we're interested and the person listening is interested, but tell me why you're so interested as a person who's come through academia, been in an environment that kind of poo-poos all of it, but you are <laughs> fascinated. Why do you think that this is a, a, a powerful thing to try to reintroduce into um, into academic study around neuroscience? Um, so for me, it was a personal journey to uh, get to Jungian cognitive functions. I had made a like major life mishap, and um, I had also been feeling that I wasn't, I was like an outsider of life, like I wasn't quite connected to anything. And even in academia, I had, there were a lot of red flags, like during my time there, where I, was, I felt like something was off. Like I had gone into academics to, you know, search for the truth, to um, really do some like deep dive into some like interesting topics. And what you get there is, you know, like it's a um, kind of a career race. Like people are more interested in the number of papers you're publishing, the techniques that you're using. They're not really interested in sitting there and talking about ideas. Uh, So what Jungian cognitive functions and the MBTI really gave me was like an understanding of my own um, experience, my own life experience, um, and helped to explain some of the things that I went through after this like large mistake or, um, um, and what had happened in my life. Um, basically like almost a psych, well, it was a psychotic break and my brain wasn't working the way that I had become accustomed to it working. Um, and it was then when I started reading about cognitive functions on personality junkie that things really start to click together. Um, and then on top of that, because I'm, I'm using introverted thinking and through all of that, I'm trying to like understand my emotions, understand what's going on and kind of like get beneath like what my brain is doing. Um, I was able, well, 
to me, it, I linked cognitive functions to um, emotions, but also um, something I had been studying, which was neuro, neuromodulation, which is the hormones of the brain. So just to make sure that the person listening has a, uh, a framework or, or an understanding of what you do, can you explain exactly what neuroscience is? Because there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's the, the study of the mind and the study of the brain and the study of the psyche. And, and I think we as laymen have a tendency to sort of merge all of it together. You know, like what's the difference between psychology and psychiatry and neuroscience and all, all of that? Can you orientate uh, us to what specifically neuroscience studies? Right. So um, neuroscience studies the connection between uh, genes at the basic level, then molecules, and then all the way up to behavior. And so there's a lot of different um, approaches to neuroscience. So I was actually studying it from the cellular side. So I was uh, working on mice and rats and looking at single cells, recording from them, uh, recording action potentials, dumping a bunch of molecules on them and seeing what happens. Uh, but you can also uh, look at it from a higher level where people are studying attention, decision making, and then they're scanning the brain to kind of see, okay, well, that part in the front of the brain is the one involved in decision making. But um, what's actually evolving right now is that like these approaches are not really working and they're not, there's no actual theory beneath them to kind of latch all of this data onto. Uh, and so what I actually see neuroscience to me today is, is like, I don't see any neuroscience and psychology and psychiatry and evolution and biology. I don't see them as separate anymore. I see them as all connected. So that was one of the like um, insights that I had was like, oh, this is like, they're all event. What we're under trying to understand is human nature. And we're trying to understand like the fundamentals of human behavior, like why we act the way we do. And everything is kind of linked to that um, in neuroscience. And that's actually fundamentally what neuroscience should be studying. Um, and it's actually evolving in that direction. Like the more I get into it, I'm seeing like, okay, people are questioning the foundation of neuroscience, the foundation of psychology um, and what it is actually that they're studying. <laughs> to me, Jungian cognitive functions are um, about the study of uh, human decision-making and uh, why we do what we do. So then neuroscience takes all of the aspects into consideration. Like you meant, like I mentioned, like on a cellular level. So that's like the actual brain matter, right? That's like the physical aspects of the brain. But then it's also studying all the way up to behaviors and why we're making our decisions, which would include mind and it would include psyche. So it's like this big overarching. It's like trying to study the whole thing, it sounds like. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why it's so fascinating. I think that intuitively, like, that's not what I studied in my undergrad. It was biochemistry. And intuitively, I'm like, oh, this field, like, that's where there's the most unknown. And that's where I'm going. Like, and I had no background. I just went. <laughs> and like, even just looking back at that decision, it was completely, you know, it was just like an intuition that that was something interesting. And that was a field I wanted to get into. And uh, through graduate school, you kind of lose a lot of that because you're, you're focusing so, so much on your particular small topic. Mm. And I don't know, rediscovering or discovering Jungian cognitive functions really helped to say like, oh, that, that showed me the big picture, like where everything fit. As a person who's been through this experientially, why do you think academia doesn't, doesn't like this or doesn't really talk about this much? Why, why is type and personality and even Jungian ideas... Why do you think it's avoided in academic circles? Uh, that's a great question. It's actually one that I've been bringing up a lot on Twitter and I haven't got a satisfactory answer. There are a lot of um, different threads that I found. So one is that Young made a big point of saying that he was scientific, but a lot of people that came after him kind of questioned that. Uh, I think that if Young had focus more on like the philosophical aspects of type and not being so like concerned about being a scientific theory that it would have maybe gained more traction. Mm. Uh, I'm also seeing some weird stuff about him being a Nazi, mm. wow. <laughs> which I don't think is true. And, but people will use that label just like they're using it on um, Isabel Myers and Catherine Briggs in the book Personality Brokers, which I'm reading right now. 
uh, they'll use that label to kind of discount ideas that they don't like. Uh, so I think that is what happened. And also at the time that um, Young was writing his ideas, people were discovering um, genetics and there was a field of population genetics that came out of it that kind of, it disregarded um, topologies. Uh, so it said that like tr um, behavioral traits are all continuous and on a spectrum and there's no such thing as like, you know, like um, having extra, like you're not extroverted or introverted. You're kind of like somewhere um, along a bell curve in the middle. And so the, uh, and yeah, so with population genetics also came uh, more understanding of genetics. And there they said like, okay, all these traits are, um, they're on a bell curve and they're also all, all polygenic. And so that would, if everything was, um, if underneath it, the genetics were all poly, like based on lots and lots of genes, that would mean that you couldn't have something like one person preferring introverted, fun uh, introverted thinking and another person um, preferring extroverted thinking. Cause that's quite, quite a dichotomy. You can't do both. You're not in between introverted thinking and extroverted thinking. And so there's all these different components that make it so that, I mean, I think possibly the stuff you're talking about um, is maybe more newer sentiments about reasons to reject, like maybe specifically Jung's work. Mm -hmm. I, I suspect over the years, I mean, just to throw my my theoretical hat in the ring, I've wondered sometimes if because this whole field is already a soft science, and there's such a desire to be accepted, particularly during like the modernist time period, to be accepted as a legitimate science, uh, because science was so, I mean, really, it was very worshipped, you know, sort of in the post- Mid-century, right? Yeah, mid-century, and it was going to be the solution to everything. And so things feel like they went very behavioral in order to create, you know, sort of like a- uh, results that could be replicated and to be able to point things out so everybody could agree on them. And this idea of like going a level deeper into the psyche, you are automatically tapping into something that is an abstraction, right? Like it's something that's so, um, it, it's something that really is very hard to point to in a concrete way. And there's, it feels to me that there was a bit of insecurity that was woven into like sort of the entire field. What's nice about neuroscience is that neuroscience, or at least what it feels like that direction went, is it was like, okay, well, what we'll do is we'll find these like sort of physical foundations for everything. We'll figure out how like the actual brain itself, like the physical little piece of meat that the brain is, how it relates to all of these other things. And then that will legitimize it as something that's like solid and concrete and like real. And I suspect that that's um, uh, part of the challenge. Yes, I definitely uh, agree with um, that, that the neuroscience is definitely um, focused on the facts and the data um, and not so much on, uh, I guess you could call it the psyche or the soul. But to me, I really think that Jungian cognitive functions are like physically real, like they do have um, an implementation in the brain. I um, think that the implementation is uh, fundamentally connected to like our emotions. Our emotions are kind of guiding us in um, basically what it is, is that personality type and your dominant and your auxiliary function is where, are where you're most comfortable because those are your preferences. And it's because you value um, that way of thinking, but also the stimuli right? So ex let's say extroverted intuition is really interested in ideas, collecting ideas, and it's collecting them just like um, we spoke about yesterday. It's almost like that's our food, <laughs> right? And, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and there's like an emotional tie to that. Like we get excited and passionate and um, those, and those um, ideas that we learn about and that make sense and that kind of fit into our framework, we remember them really well. And that brings in memory. And so I'm like, okay, look, like people remember things differently because of their personality type. Like, why do people have different reactions um, to the same situation? Like, why do you get like five different stories when there's five different people involved, right? Because everyone's kind of picking up on 
uh, different cues and signals and stimuli um, within that interaction, they're all focused on different things. And so they'll all come out with different stories. Mm -hmm. And to me, uh, that's fundamentally linked to uh, our emotional system. And that becomes really interesting because, um, you know, early studies on the genetics of like dog behavior um, kind of pinpointed to this idea that the endocrine system, which is our hormones, is involved. Like when you start breeding dogs for um, particular personality traits, they start changing in, um, you know, the level of... Um, noradrenaline that they have. And that can, you, just changing that one molecule can have um, an impact on the personality of um, the animal. And I think this is um, where personality type will kind of integrate into uh, what we understand about neuroscience and kind of help to formulate new theories and new directions for where people can uh, you know, start looking for, start experimenting and start looking for new data to kind of make these things make sense. So then uh, part of, or I might be circling the drain here a little bit, but I think what I'm pulling out of what you're saying is that one of the things you're speculating on is that the reason we have these type preferences is because our reward centers are rewarding different things for us individually. Like I'm getting rewarded for using extroverted intuition. It's why it's my preference. Yeah, exactly. And so the chemicals or the hormones or the neurotransmitters or whatever it is that's imp like, like that, all that stuff that's going on in my brain is dumping all of these rewarding chemicals every time I use that function. And I may be pre-wired to have those reward centers light up with those specific functions. Exactly. That's exactly what I think. And, and, and what it, it helped, well, and people don't like to think those things because then it kind of gives your, like it, it kind of makes you determined, right? Like you weren't in charge of um, what cognitive functions you were going to develop. They were already there and, and what you were going to like and dislike. So there were, that was to me, that's genetically predetermined mm. um, and people want to be able to choose or have a sense of free will. Right. Mm. Um, but here it's kind of, kind of making personality deterministic in a way it's not completely because of course there's type development and, um, you can, um, you can use, um, different functions. You can, uh, you can bring in and develop your tertiary, and, um, fourth functions, um, to give more flexibility to your behavior. Um, but at the end of the day, it kind of, it, it is a deterministic theory. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it raises a bunch of philosophical and social questions too in that, you know, I can imagine like this this really flies in the face of a, of a, of a democratic idea of equality, for example. Equality yeah. of skill, equality of temperament, equality of like, there's a sentiment that we're all born exactly equal in all of our competencies and the ways we show up. And this, I think, is very threatening to that idea because if there's a determination to to different people, that means people are very different at the outset. And and I don't think that means they're, I personally don't think that means they're unequal as people. I think every human is valuable, but I could see that being something that people would definitely push back against because it really, it, it, it challenges the notion around some of those ideas or it adds complexity to it, I guess. The conversation gets even more complex than it already yeah. is. Exactly. I agree completely with you that it's, um, and especially in the atmosphere right now, it's very challenging because we're going for equity and equality. And just like you said, people assume that like once you're born, there's like a blank slate that we can, we can pick our desires. We can choose what we value, uh, what we like, what we dislike. Um, and exactly that flies in the face of it. And I think there is pushback. Like people don't want, um, want to acknowledge that. And, um, it's the same in behavioral genetics uh, where the data there definitely show that uh, there's a huge component to genetics versus like your parental upbringing, um, that genes do play a large role in uh, per personality traits and behavioral traits and, and psychological um, traits. Well, and, and forgive me for going down a little bit of a tangent off, off topic, but one could maybe even see the the gestalt response in the world right now, like the topic of our time around equality and equity, 
maybe it's a sense, a collective sense as humans, an intuitive sense we have of if the measurements get more sophisticated and we start to measure some of these quote unquote deterministic things, we want to make sure we have a philosophy of how, how we want to actually treat each other. And it's right. almost like maybe collectively we're, we're really pushing on this hard before those measurements come because that could, like we don't want to live in a world like that, like where you get sorted, mm-hmm. at, sorted at birth and these people are determined. It's like, you know, what's, uh, it's like a Hunger Games type situation in districts or something. That's not what we want to see. <laughs> well, I think, there's, I think the movie or, series or the young adult series was divergent. Or divergent, right? right? It's like the, we don't want that kind of a world. And so it's maybe this push to say we need a philosophy or a way of thinking that can help when we have maybe more sophisticated measurements for humans to ensure that doesn't create an unequal uh, footing for us. So I just, I thought that maybe right. uh, that might be something that's coming up for, for us as a, as a humanity right now. Yeah, I think you're exactly right because like, what does it mean to have a personality type? And um, was this something that developed because um, specialization was uh, adaptive, like to have division of labor and to not have everyone be like, um, basically good at everything, right? Specialization is, um, like a fundamental feature of evolution when there's competition. Um, but what does that mean in in today's age? Like, are exactly, are we going to DNA type people from birth and say like, okay, well, I, you're an INTP. I'm just going to throw books at you. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not really what I see happening. Um, but at the same time, like I'm not on the side of people that see this as um, constraining. I actually see personality type as like enhancing, like it's actually done like a, um, for my own life, it's actually like expanded it and made it okay to be me where I was, you know, so on the outside of like everyone else. Yeah, I think the the beauty in it is if you have a framework that you're like, okay, I kind of see how my mind works. I'm an INTP. I, I see how I'm similar to other INTPs. To me, it's freeing because now you also see the ways in which you are different. There's these mm-hmm. non-measurable human spirit elements of us, right? That that make up who we are. That are differentiators. That can never. They're more. They're more abstract humans. They're not even about the neuroscience. They're just something in the spirit of who we are. The the spark that makes us alive and human. That gives mm-hmm. us the the vibrancy of life. And when we know our type, it's like wow, that stuff becomes comes into really sharp relief because we see how much how much uniqueness we all have when we see our similarities. It's kind of a weird double, you know, double to it or the other side of it. Yeah, exactly. Because of course, like, like all the INTP brains sort of function similarly, but what you've uploaded into it is all different. So what I had inside my brain at the time that I made all the connections to type is completely different than someone else. And so you do end up with this uniqueness that you can then, um, you can then use to kind of show that to the world, right? Like if I think about it, I'm like, okay, well, how many other people in the world might have ended up where I did with the information I did? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think of it as a difference between operating systems and software. Mm -hmm. Like like, uh, Windows and OS are two different operating systems, but you can actually have the same apps. You know, if somebody has taken the time to code them in those languages, you can play the same game or have the same app in each of those operating systems. Or because of the operating systems, uh, sometimes the apps are slightly different. Like you can't code them identical, but you can get pretty darn close. Showing that there's a difference between those two levels or layers. And I kind of see type as operating system level. And then I think Mm -hmm. of like the software, the apps that get put on it, those are all very individualized. And that's why you can have two people of two different types kind of coming up, showing up similar because they have the same app on two different operating systems. Or two people of the same operating system ending up having very similar, even if there's different quote unquote software apps, they kind of look similar because they're living in the same platform. So uh, yeah, that's in my mind, whenever I'm trying to illustrate how this looks, that's usually my go-to metaphor for seeing the differences here. We will be right back. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth, 
and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker. Now back to the show. I want to go back to what you said about uh, like the choice and it feels deterministic. It shows that there's a, there's a very complicated relationship that I think we as humans have with this idea of identity. Most people who are interested in type, we, we're okay with thinking that we were born with our type, right? Like that doesn't make us feel like we're in a box. I mean, I know a lot of people have challenges with typology systems because they think that that's what you're trying to do is put everybody in a box and oversimplify everything. But I think those of us who have gone down this road far enough realize, listen, I came with preferences. I can remember them from the time I was tiny. Anytime I was not allowed to show up with these preferences, I was miserable and I found a way to do so. And when I was more in alignment with my preferences, suddenly everything was like, you know, it was like greasing wheels. Everything became so much better. Because we've had this personal experience with it, it doesn't feel limiting. It feels like it's liberating to discover these aspects of it. And then, as we just mentioned, knowing that I, I'm an ENTP, but I'm not like other ENTPs. Like, there's a lot of other ENTPs out mm-hmm. there that I don't have a lot in common with. And there's some ENTPs I have a ton in common with. But the one thing I have in common with all of them is that we all must fuel our extroverted intuition and our introverted thinking, right? <laughs> and we're all going to have you know, the, all the other predictable elements of being this type. So uh, I think that what's interesting about what you're studying is that even though there might be some pushback against those kinds of concepts, uh, I think as a general rule, going back to this idea of like, well, maybe if Jung had talked about philosophy a little bit more than science, and that popped up the term neurophilosophy in my mind. I don't know if that's an actual field or a study. It probably is. Mm -hmm. Um, But this idea of like, okay, well, let's pretend it doesn't have to be scientific in the way that we have been influenced by a modernist world to see science. Maybe there's like some openness here to, to some wiggle room of philosophy. And as you and I talked to Denise, one of the things that you really love about functions is that as a person who studies neuroscience, this becomes a framework to hang pieces of information on. You mentioned earlier that like in the, the field of neuroscience, there's all these pieces of information, but no grand theory of everything to put them all in or like connect them. And if we were to see it not in terms of necessarily at this point measurable, but sort of a philosophy of a system that allows you to organize all these pieces of information, and then maybe at some point we'll have the instruments to be able to very specifically measure them, which is, it seems to be coming online more and more. But in the meantime, just seeing this as a theory that allows us to organize all this information, you really feel that Jungian cognitive functions is a, as an elegant theory to hang all these on, like almost pegs to hang this information on. Um, would you be willing to talk about why you feel? Young? I mean, I know that you had a personal relation, you know, experience that made it very powerful. But are there other angles you're looking at it from that make you feel that functions are one of the best frameworks to use mm-hmm. to sort of understand this complicated world of? of uh, all these different elements of the brain. Right. Um, so I, yeah, as I was mentioning before, like the interaction between functions and emotions and um, this idea. So there's in neuroscience, there's an idea that we make decisions in a uh, context dependent way, right? So it's situation dependent. We learn as we're growing up. Um, okay. If I'm at school, um, this is the way that things should be done so that I get rewarded. And if I'm at home, this is the way things that should be done. And how that's implemented, that's actually been studied in um, worms and lobsters, is that there's like, it's the fixed circuit, like you were saying um, about the hardware. Um, so the brain comes with like, like, let's say all human brains are approximately the same. They come all wired the same. Uh, the neurons are all connecting um, to one another in the same way. But then on top of that, um, you have uh, what you were talking about, like the software, uh, and which to my mind, how it connects to like the neuroscience of decision making or context dependent decision making is that that software is are these molecules, the, the brain chemistry, uh, things like serotonin, oxytocin, dopamine, because you were talking about the reward system. So the reward system is connected to dopamine. Oxytocin is connected to uh, like group behavior and parental behaviors. Serotonin is like mood and sleep. Um, And so 
you, I kind of see like our use of the cognitive functions, we use them when we're in particular types of moods, or when we want to shift into particular types of moods. Um, just like extroverted uh, intuition can kind of give us a boost, like where we're collecting ideas, um, kind of give us a boost in the reward um, system. Whereas introverted thinking to me growing up, like I was always in a kind of depressed state. <laughs> um, so I think introverted thinking really likes to disengage from like the emotional system and to have things be quite quiet. So that would be like a separate kind of um, mood. And so, and then, and then the inferior function, the fourth functions, the stuff that I've read about it is that um, when you're in a heightened state, so a heightened arousal state, like if you were, um, like if you activated your um, flight and fight system, your uh, adrenaline system, or if you were in love, we kind of shift into that uh, fourth function, which to me was really interesting because you're kind of going back and forth between all of the functions based on your brain chemistry. And so to me, the challenge is to actually be able to explain that <laughs> in a coherent way. Like, like I see the connections in my mind and everything kind of makes sense, but it, it doesn't really make sense when you start to write it all down because it's, it's three-dimensional. Uh, so that's the link to um, neuromodulation and context dependent decision making. Uh, and now I'm trying to think, oh, yeah. So the other parts of um, neuroscience and psychology that I've mapped it onto are so when if we talk about mood, we can also go into um, psychological concepts like flow and happiness. And so to me, like the um, happiness is a result of using your. Um, first four functions, but probably um, having some aspects of all of them in, are involved um, towards like a similar goal. You're kind of getting all the functions to like play well together. And that when you're in that zone, that is equivalent to flow. Uh, so it kind of ties in um, those aspects of psychology and happiness and stuff. And then on the other flip side, which is not really neuroscience, it's um, uh, going deep into like evolution and the background on these functions is like, okay, well, um, how did these functions evolve? Um, like what impact did they have on like small tribes and um, hunter gatherer tribes and the decision-making there? Uh, you know, why is there this specialization and division of labor and how does that all kind of connect together? Hmm. Yeah, I, I was afraid that after I asked you, I had basically repeated something or was going to have you repeat something you said before, but you just gave so much more information around that same topic. I'm so glad I asked you again <laughs> because you just gave like so much great stuff. What I wanted... Yeah, I'm trying to. And, and even if you look at the at the personality literature that's already there, it's kind of it, it in some way to me, like there was Jungian psychology, which and, and going even beyond person, his personality type theory or his psychological type, the book, he had a whole um, encompassing theory of um, human development and human, um, and human personality through, through over time, right? Like the mm -hmm. midlife crisis mm -hmm. and uh, individuation mm -hmm. and uh, like how, you know, like how you, you bring in your fourth functions as you age and how that makes you like more whole, like that, 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 that a lot of that's philosophy. And um, I find that the researchers have, they, they've kind of circled back to similar type theories that kind of map to young, but they're all separate. Like one person has um, personality trait theory. Okay. So that's one part of it, but then um, there's another field looking at how, uh, personality traits can change based on situations, which is what I was kind of um, um, explaining uh, with the type dynamics and how type type the cognitive functions interact with our uh, brain chemistry. Um, so I find that if you look through the threads of science, that there's pieces of young everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And that he, like you said, like I actually see it as the like young having a theory of everything and that people have just kind of circled back, but to smaller pieces. Yeah. When we talk about 
the brain's representation of a cognitive function. Are you, and you said it's tied to like the emotional reward system. Are mm-hmm. you, have we gotten to the place, and my question might be, it's, it's a discovery question as I ask it. I might bear out my ignorance in this as I say it, so forgive me. Uh, is it, have you mapped a function to say, oh, like introverted thinking, when we look at a brain, it's these neural pathways, X, Y, Z, and it's in this flow chart of electrodes like firing in this particular order. That's what we mean when we say the the function of introverted thinking. Or am I thinking about that incorrectly? Like, is no, it- you're thinking, yeah, it, that that like, um, that's how I would like it to be. Like, if we had a really good measure of uh, an accurate measure of someone's personality type, if we put them into uh, fMRI machines and took brain scans. Uh, could we locate the functions? Okay. And what's interesting to me is you can actually divide up the front part of the brain into uh, an area that's more concerned with um, feelings and social behavior. So that's like the the bottom bit. So it's called the ventral um, prefrontal cortex. And so social neuroscience and neuroscience has like linked that area to um to you know being able to uh, tell other people's emotions and um or even your own emotions and um the upper part of the prefrontal cortex called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex seems to me more um more tied to uh thinking and uh more like logic based um not considering the emotions and then if you kind of tie that in with other people's theories, like Ian McGilchrist has a like, oh, well, we need to bring the logic and the feeling parts together. So it seems to be that those two parts of the prefrontal cortex are not usually talking to each other or something happens during development that you repress one side versus the other. And that a part of individuation is trying to bring these two functionalities um, into communication with one another. Wow. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, so there is, like, but it's like, like I said, it's all intuition based. It's all kind of like, I have this feeling that it all connects in that way, but there's no real, um, data there. And as we develop more instruments to measure these things, as time goes on, uh, some things will become more clear to us, I'm guessing. And you can potentially measure, uh, like the function is just a label or a name we've given to a certain neuro pathway is what I'm hearing you mm-hmm. say. And so eventually we can hopefully measure in a consistent way the same neural pathway over and over again showing up and going, okay, that's introverted thinking or that's extroverted thinking or that's introverted feeling or whatever. And we're starting to see those, those patterns emerge, especially as the instruments get better and better. Well, to piggyback yeah, off the what instruments, you're... but even, even what's interesting is that some of this stuff would be really simple. It's like even just knowing that people... Uh, react in different ways to different stimuli and that the stimuli are divided in certain ways, right? Like extroverted sensing versus extroverted intuition. Like, okay, that, that's just show people like, you know, pictures of mountains and, and sunsets and stuff or, or idea, right? Like the, that, that, that terminology or that knowledge is not even part of like the neuroscience psyche that that is actually a, you know, fundamental truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, to piggyback off what you're talking about too, Joel, uh, that's what, I mean, um, Dario Nardi, who has been a guest many times on our podcast, he's a friend, um, and uh, a lot of his work has been trying to map this all out. And it's not just a single pathway, neural pathway. It's of course. usually a combination I, of them. I'm oversimplifying yeah, yeah. it for, for yeah. illustration reasons. Yeah. To illustrate it, exactly. But there seems to be like, you know, a certain, uh, you know, functions, there's a very predictable set of things that the brain will do when that's kicked up. Like you were mentioning, Denise, this idea of like showing pictures of something that would trigger the part of our brain that might be more interested in extroverted sensing. Or like um, Dario's noticed that when somebody is using the function of introverted feeling, uh, there's a halo effect that happens uh, particularly auditorily around their, you know, around their brain and just like little things like this. And what, Mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. Uh, If you have something to say on that one, I want to hear it. Uh, no, it's, I was just agreeing with you. Okay. So I was going to say what is striking me right now is that it's so slow going because the instrument that you're attempting to create at the end of all of it would be super convenient at the beginning of all of it, right? Like you're trying to create the instrument that measures all of these things. So it's not just measuring them, it's creating the device that can measure them. 
And that means that in the early days, this like this, you know, we just trog through <laughs> like we're like, OK, so uh, we're going to have to first theorize that this is a thing. And then we're going to have to figure out how to measure all of this stuff using a lot of um, self-reporting. And I right. think that that's one of the biggest challenges in all of this is that, uh, you know, as we're studying all of it, I think that anybody who does this kind of research accounts for anomalies. They understand that, you know, especially when it comes to like self-reported assessments, that they're going to have to account for error rates and, you know, try try to get as clean a data as possible, recognizing that in a self-reporting environment, you're only going to get, so, you know, your, your data is only going to be so clean and to account for all of that. But you're working on some really cool stuff, Denise, that uh, potentially would make the instruments far more accessible. Would you be willing to talk about the research you're currently doing? Right. So um, what I'm uh, trying to do is to link uh, genes or a person's DNA to their personality type. So I'm actually trying to find um, genetic variants. So we all have... Um, like our DNA is almost all identical, except uh, there's about, um, usually between two people, there's about 10,000 um, differences. And those are called uh, genetic variants that differ between people. And in the literature, those are actually called single nucleotide polymorphisms. And that's what um, makes individuals unique. And so my thought is that uh, the difference between an introverted thinker and an extroverted thinker um, if I'm linking that to emotions would be due to a uh, mutation or a difference in the uh, potentially the receptors for these hormones that I was talking about before, which are oxytocin, uh, dopamine, serotonin, et cetera. And so my goal is to link. Um, I mean, I'm not um, I'm not doing a screen for those molecules in particular. I'm doing a whole um, genomic screen using uh, genotyping. And um, the hope is to link certain of these genetic variants to each cognitive function. And so if I can get a whole bunch of um, INTPs, do they have a genetic pattern that is different than, let's say, the INTJs, if I were to compare the two? So what's required? Like, what does a person have to give you in order to be able to be like a part of that kind of research? Right. So what I'm looking for is uh, a person's genotyping data, which they would have um, been able to get through either 23andMe, Ancestry DNA, there's Family Tree DNA, and there's a few more. Um, and I can take uh, genetic data from any of those companies. And uh, they would have to upload it to a uh, third party, which is called Open Humans. Um, but what I found, so uh, Open Humans is a place where you can um, share your data, but also the data can remain private. And so uh, there's actually like a security around your data there. And then uh, the person would have to take uh, three personality tests to kind of triangulate uh, and better map their uh, best fit personality type. Mm. And so if a person is interested in being part of this kind of research or just wants to keep up with where you're at as you're writing your papers on it and really sort of understand what the latest is in that, where can they find you to to, to be a part of all this cool new burgeoning stuff? So the study is at personalitygenie.com. Uh, that's where a person can sign up for the study. Uh, if they just want to uh, follow along, uh, they can just create an account and... Uh, and not participate, not upload their data, they would still be able to get into the site and the dashboard. Got it. So personality. Uh, you can genie. also you, you can also take the personality tests without uploading your DNA. Although uh, it is my hope that people that take the personality tests will also upload a, a DNA sample. Awesome. So genie as in G E N I E. Yes. Okay. So personalitygenie.com. Denise, thank you so much for being willing to be on the uh, interviewed by us to talk about the work you're you're doing, to talk about the relationship between type and neuroscience and all this cool stuff. We are super excited to see what comes down the line for you. So thank you so much for sharing. Oh, thank you for inviting me here. It was my pleasure. So you've been listening along. You've been the fourth person in this conversation. You haven't had a microphone like myself, Denise, and Antonia, but we want to hear from you now. So come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this episode. We'd love to hear your comments. Maybe you have a question for Denise or the topics that came up in this conversation. 
And more importantly, we'd love to hear your story. Do you have a story of seeing some of these patterns play out in your life? Do you have any... Maybe you've got some neuroscience research yourself that you've done. I don't know. I have no idea. Come over and tell us <laughs> over at personalhacker.com directly below this episode. We'd love to hear from you. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you leave us rating and review for us on iTunes, that helps us out a lot. If you're confused about some of the concepts that are being talked about, cognitive functions and personality type, what's all this jibber jabber? You can check out our book. It's called Personality Hacker. We break down the system, explain how you can find the cognitive functions for your best fit type. And then we also talk about how those cognitive functions relate to each of the individual personality types uh, and how you can use an understanding to leverage good things in your life. We also have a suite of pro. Oh, and you can get that book. I should say where you can get it. Uh, you can get that book at all major book retailers, or you can special order it through your local bookstore and support local bookstores because they're closing down and it's very sad. So let's give, let's throw a little love to them. And uh, and if you enjoyed that book, you can leave us a rating and review on Amazon or on Goodreads. We also have a suite of programs that are personal growth oriented through the lens of personality type. So if it's time, if you're ready to invest in yourself and go to the next level in your growth journey, head over to personalityhacker.com, look at our suite of programs and see if there's one that's right for you. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker.